Felix here. A question I get asked a lot is, Felix, what stock would you buy today and hold forever? Well, I'm not just going to give you that one stock. I'm going to give you the top five stocks that I do actually hold. So full disclosure, and we're going to walk through why. Now, who's going to really walk you through this? Tallulah. She's done all the research, haven't you? <laughs> She's purring. Before we do that, I want to encourage you to join me this Sunday when I will show you exactly how I'm up 73% ROCE so far this year and how Toluda and I on my lap do that in three hours a week. Felix runs log slash webinar, probably the last time I mention it. Slight chance I might mention it again. So what are we going to look at here today? Here we go. We're going to look at the fundamentals of these companies, the recent fundamental performance. We're going to understand the business. We're going to not look at the stock chart. Why not? If your time frame is forever, the stock chart is 100% irrelevant. So we're just not, not even going to bother. We're not going to look at it. We are also going to talk about growth stocks. And I'll tell you my secret. There's a secret in here right at the end. So watch till the end. Now, let's get cracking. Okay. So stock number one, I'm not going to tell you quite yet what it's called. Maybe you can guess. If you can guess, put it down below. Well, there is, it might be on the screen here if you can read carefully. But either way, it has got a pretty fantastic fundamental setup here, right? So if you look at, maybe get a pen, Microsoft says, no, why are we not number one? Growth health is amazing. Cash flow is amazing. Price momentum is out of this world. I mean, it's almost too nerdy. It's almost too good. Uh, profit health is incredible. Relative value. That's, I guess, a tick for me. Why? When your profit health is A, that means you're an incredibly profitable company. You're not going to be super cheap. We just have to accept that. Good stuff costs money, right? Except for this kitten here. She was free. This was free. Picked her up off the street, didn't we? Mm -hmm. There we go. You get free kittens uh, if you just look for them. Now, let's look at some fundamental data here. And these are the numbers I would look at for every stock you ever want to own right from the beginning. Gross profit margin. I generally want that to be bigger than 60%. It's 84%. And this is the trend. It's just consistent, solid, with the word that comes to my mind. Revenue. Well, really, I just look at the chart and it says... Moon, net income, that's profit, fancy word for profit, that says moon. Return on invested capital is 64%. Okay, I normally, let's <laughs> back up a second. I normally look for a return on invested capital or ROIC number of 15% plus. This company has a 64%. What are they selling? Drugs? Is this like Al Capone back with a listed business? It's insane, right? Long-term earnings growth rate, 22%. Again, I'd like that generally to be 10, 12% plus because I like my stocks to go up about 12% a year. Maybe a little bit more is nice. And if I take these two numbers together, return on capital invested, like how much money are they making on the capital they've got and how much are profits going up by? If those go up by, say, 12% together each, why would the stock price not go up a similar amount? That's sort of my rough maths in my head. And of course, none of this is financial advice, just an old banker sharing the thoughts of his cat. She's still on my lap. She seems very happy. Enterprise value over EBITDA. That's sort of your... Um, your thinking man's P.E. ratio. No, I mean, it's not particularly useful, honestly. I just wanted to get a snapshot here of how, how valuable is this in a sense. And, and it's, it's, it's going up. So people are liking this. People are buying it. People are buying it at higher prices. That in itself is neither good nor bad. It's just if it's, you know, a thousand or something, then I, I'll, I might have a little bit of a de 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 deeper dig there. Um, just a couple of appointments here. Uh, high earnings quality, revenue growth is amazing, accelerating, very high invested capital return, raises dividends for six consecutive months. If you know my feeling on dividends, don't like them, but I can't help that people pay them. And yeah, it's just been, been good. They'll be profitable this year. So let's get a little bit more into performance. P not performance anxiety, performance. Have they been consistent with their earnings? And okay, there have been a couple of misses on earnings per share and two misses on revenue. But overall, this is sort of like a, a B, I'd say. They're, they're doing pretty well, right? So we're looking at are these earnings per share and the revenue numbers consistently outperforming what, what the market's expecting? And they're doing a decent job with that. 
This is the business. It's Novo, no, Novo Nordisk. It's the largest company in Europe, bigger than LVMH now. And what's the reason they're so successful? That, sorry, that. That gut of that man, that obesity that's killing him slowly on the inside, disabling his immune system and making him fatter and fatter and more unhealthy and lifting weights. It's a good idea, but he obviously needs to do a little bit more and fundamentally he needs to change his diet. But unfortunately, Rafael in uh, Mexico is not aware of that. This is what they're making money out of. And you might morally object to that. And I totally get it. I morally object to it, but I'm taking the money. Right? And I'll preach that people shouldn't be eating cake and sugar. Sugar is your enemy, honestly. Uh, stay away from the stuff. Anything out of a packet, anything processed, all that stuff is terrible. What do they make money out of? Well, diabetes. Novo Nordisk is the leading diabetes and obesity drug company out there. Uh, they make Wegovy, that drug that apparently you take once a week and you know, you come out looking a size six, like a supermodel, even though you're stuffing your face with McDonald's and drinking Coca-Cola and just injecting all sorts of, you know, terrible things into your body. So they have a they have a 32 percent market share of the global diabetes market. And um, that's what they make money out of. It's basically drugs. Obesity care sales grew 157% in the first half of the year 2023, mainly driven by the US. So next time you go through the drive through think about that. You're making money for Felix. Thank you very much. Cha-ching. And part of that are, are two dr drugs. They've got Wegovy here and the and branded AOM markets are just, you know, other brands. Uh, but yeah, the Wegovy thing is absolutely insane. It's just just making them so much money. It's it's It should be illegal. It should be illegal, actually, but it isn't. So they're making loads of money. So you can either sit on the sidelines or you can you can join them. Of course, this is in financial advice. But yeah, that's essentially that. It's obesity that what's it's what's driving this. Diabetes is caused by obesity. And I know some people are going to get very upset about that, but it's generally diet. It's very, very, very rarely genetics. Genetics is usually an excuse for like not changing your diet. And maybe if your parents have it, your grandparents have it, and I'm sorry if that that's the case, have a look at if they're eating something similar to you. Is the lifestyle the same, right? There's a lot you can do to get yourself off these drugs. But okay, I'm going to get some haters there in the comments and that's okay. I don't mind that. What about this lovely little company then? I know we're giving it, giving it away for someone who's just looking carefully. Growth health, amazing. Cash flow, amazing. Price momentum, amazing. Profit health, amazing. Amazing. Uh, relative value, actually great because profit health is glorious. So this company, why am I holding this forever? Why am I holding the fat drug forever? Because I have very little faith that humanity will change the way it eats and lives, particularly those on lower incomes, sadly, will continue to believe the advertising of McDonald's and co. Uh, and therefore, they will continue to eat all the rubbish that's made at supermarkets and so on. It's very hard to find something in supermarkets in a lot of places that is actually healthy. So obesity wins. And so what about this one here? Well, gross profit margin, 68%. That's a check. Remember, I like that about 60%. And above, revenue is what are we doing here? What are we doing here, Microsoft? Going up, net income is <laughs> 72 billion. A profit of 72 billion. You think they've got enough money lying around? A return on invested capital. Again, I said I'd like that to be, you know, 15% plus. It's 28%. And it's been going up, coming down a little bit, but still amazing. Long-term earnings growth rate 13%. That's in line with my ideally 12% plus. And it's valued, actually, it's cheaper than the drugs thing up, up, up there, right? It's cheaper than the drugs thing. It's had a bit of a dip here, which is presumably uh, the COVID bubble. But overall, pretty staggering, pretty staggering numbers, right? And yeah, dividends going up for, for 17 years in a row. Everyone loves it. Um, pretty not prominent play in the software industry. Cash flow is amazing large price uptick in the last six months. That's something to think about. But in the long run, it doesn't bloody matter. What about earnings? So again, here you've got the purple charts, that's actual earnings. And then you've got the blue chart. Let me get a blue pen. The blue chart is estimate, right? So you want the purple always to be larger than, than the blue. And that's the case pretty much always. 
pretty much always. So very, very, very consistent performer, very good management, clearly. And of course, we're talking about Microsoft, the company that nobody loves, yet makes money for pretty much every shareholder out there. And why is this such an incredible business? This is the last quarter. Office commercial grown 12%. Office consumer products grown 3%. Commercial seed growth was 11%. 67 million, let me just write that down, 67 million paying subscribers to, yeah, 365, you know, Microsoft 365 subscriptions. So they just pay every month. They can't help themselves. Um, We've got Dynamics products that sort of cloud 19% up, LinkedIn up 5%. That's indicating there is slowing and hiring. LinkedIn is largely a uh, jobs business. And revenue is up 10% for a business that old. That is pretty staggering stuff. It just is very, very difficult to keep growing at 10% when you've been around for decades. right? And they've actually had 2% headwinds on 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 currency exchanges. So the 10% is a, is a marvelous, marvelous number. And look at their financials. Q4. Growth 10% on productivity in business, cloud 15%. Personal computing is down a little bit. That's just been the case in, everywhere. But overall, 8% revenue growth. Gross margins grew 11%. So they're growing their gross margins by two points, even though they've been around forever. So they're cutting costs. Operating income is going up by four points, net income by 20%. That's profit, right? Net income is a fancy word for actual profit and earnings per share up 21%. I mean, you really can't fault these guys. They just keep making just good enough products that everybody can't live without. That's Microsoft for you. What about the next one here? Let me cover up the, the top there, so you, you're finding it a little bit harder to to, to predict what it is. Uh, so cash flow health, chiching growth health. Oh my God, price momentum and profit health. It's an A. It's an A. It's almost embarrassing, isn't it? So therefore, the relative value for me, it's like whatever. We've got a lifetime, right? That's our that's our time horizon here. Maybe even longer. Maybe you're doing this for your children or your grandchildren. And look at these numbers. Gross profit margin, seventy three percent. I could cry. That's how good it is. They get. 6 billion profit. Return on invested capital is 16%. That's fantastic. Long-term earnings growth, 10%. A little bit lower than I'd like it to be, but still pretty good. And therefore, their multiplier is a little lower, right? So it's probably the cheapest stock out of the ones we've looked at so far from that sort of short-term point of view. Cat's asleep on my lap, by the way, in case you were worried about her. Tallulah, hey? Sleeping. And... It's just increasing earnings per share, raised dividends for three years in a row, impressive gross profit margins, cash flow is amazing, everybody loves it. That's kind of where we are. So what is it? What is it? What is it? Well, let's have a look at their um, earnings. I've only got the revenue data because it's not a US business, uh, but they've beaten every single quarter over the last 10 quarters, their revenue expectations pretty significantly. So pretty amazing management there. What do they do? What do they do? Tell me, who is it? Sales grew from 2022, from 2019 to 2022 by 28%. Operating profits up 34%. Operating margins up 90 basis points. And uh, basically, administrative expenses have gone down. That's pretty good stuff. Right. This is where they sell in the world. I know I'm making this a little tricky for you. I like, guess it. Go on, guess it. Guess it. Put down this, the timestamp and say how, what, what the company is. It's going to be fun. Don't cheat. They're growing in the US. That's 2.6 percent of their 2.6 billion of their revenue. Now they've got euros as the currency. That's almost the same to the dollar, but for you Americans. But Europe is a slightly bigger market for them. Also growing 16 percent. This is the first quarter of the year. 2.8 billion also in Asia. So very, very equal, evenly spread. And then in, in the sort of emerging markets, they're growing at 25 percentage points, which is pretty staggering stuff. So very, very global business, clearly. And here it is. We gave it away. It is L'Oreal. Uh, the pretty face at the top should have given it away. So yeah, earnings per share up 11%. Uh, staggering stuff. And look at what they do. Just, I mean, 
you're probably a guy if you watch this channel. Our viewership seems to be 95% men. Apparently, I'm a, I'm a women repeller, despite the cute kitten. And skincare, which I'm sure you spend a lot of money on. By the way, I spend no money at all on skincare. Um, not saying it's a bad thing to do, but 14% growth. And that's 41% of the business. So this is really, this is 41% of the business. But you can't read that, can you? 41%. Makeup is 20%. Up 11%. Hair care is 15%. Also growing 15%. Fragrances, perfumes, are up 11%. And they typically have very good margins. And then hair color, which is sort of the original business, is 8% of that business. So very diversified, doing tremendous stuff here. And you will know some of these brands. If you ever walked through an airport, you will have seen, maybe it's Maybelline, you know, L'Oreal, Lancome, Kiehl's, Yves Saint Laurent, Armani, Garnier. And, you know, so they are, they own or manufacture or distribute their skincare um, perfume products. Keros Stars, Hair, L'Oreal, of course. And then all these other kind of more neutral ones, SkinCeuticals, HR, Biotherm. Some of these are obviously very, very high-end brands that you might be familiar with, like Prada, Valentino, Shuemura, Ralph Lauren, um, and, and, and so on. You know, Maison, Marguerite, some of the kind of newer, slightly newer brands, Urban Decay and Vichy and everything else. So massive, massive, massive portfolio that that lady wasn't very, very impressed by. So that's the business. It's just very, very, very good brands. And women will buy lipstick even during wars. So even in a recession, people will buy lipstick. So there isn't really anything to worry about here, in my view. Now, of course, there's a risk with everything, right? So that was L'Oreal. Next one is, I know the cat wants to leave, which of course is a problem. Don't go yet. We still need you. You've got thinking to do. Maybe on the shoulder. Maybe on the shoulder. That might work. Cash flow is... It's sort of a so-so. Growth health is great. Price momentum just means the price isn't very high. That's actually a great thing. Profit health, though, yes, and relative value to profit health. Always the logical conclusion. So, gross profit margin, 68%. Check revenue growing like mad. Check cat on the shoulder. Check making 18 billion profit. This is obviously not some mum and pap shop. Return on invested capital is 17%. Check above our target. Long-term earnings growth, 15%. It's just like my, my wet dream. And then it's trading. It's the cheapest stock so far. You know, it's that. if you look at the sort of multiple thing, if you go in for that kind of stuff, I'm not usually a fan, but it has the perfect Piotrowski score of nine. So if you're a value investor, um, you, you are in ecstasy right now. Impressive gross profit margins, dividends raising for three years in a row. So very high return in the last decade. And again, I've only got the revenue data for, for earnings here, but except with the exception of one quarter here, very, 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 very consistent management delivery, beating expectations. And of course it is Louis Vuitton, Moy NSC, um, LVMH in short, and they own pretty much everything. If you are in the sort of fashion space, if you go like to go shopping, obviously there's LV, there is Loewe, there's Celine, there is Dior, there's Givenchy, Marc Jacobs, uh, Kenzo, DKNY, L'Europeana, you know, Berluti, Emilio Pucci, all that kind of stuff, like pretty much everything. If you are um, a, a boozer, especially in the US, huge market share in the US, uh, okay, Cloudy Bay, New Zealand, but Glen Morangi, Belvedere, Terrazzas, Veuve Clicquot, Champagne, right? Hennessy, Cognacs, Krug, Champagne, uh, all that stuff. Chandon, big brands in the US, Dom Perignon, Ruina, all that kind of stuff. Makes them an absolute fortune, all pretty, pretty much premium brands. And then if you are in the cosmetic space, you know, Aqua di Parma, one of the biggest men's perfumes out there, for example, because actually smells quite decent. And then, you know, all the other stuff that you see at beauty counters around the world. Uh, Cova, even, you know, where you get your coffees if you are ever in Europe and um, Galleria and DFS and, and duty-free shoppers type stuff. So minority stake in MS, but yes, that's, that's a, I think they actually had to sell that, didn't they? they could, that those families don't get on. But it's got some numbers. 17% growth in the first half of the year, 13% profit, 27% pro operating margin, which is pretty good. And 1.8 billion free cash flow. That's like, wow. 
um, very little debt gearing. And look at what their growth looks like. This is organic revenue growth and where it comes from. So this is actually organic growth. Currencies cost them 2%. They took 36 billion revenue up to 42 billion revenue for the first half of the year. That's again in euros, but it's pretty much the same thing as dollars. So it doesn't really matter. And where is it coming from? Where are they making their money? So they're making most of their money or most of their revenue in fashion and leather goods, 18 billion last year, now 21 billion, up 17%. And that's a currency impact there. It was would it be 20% otherwise. Wines and spirits are down a little bit. And that's that's an American slowdown. US consumers spending less on, on booze. That's a thing you see everywhere. Perfumes sales up 11%, watches and jewelry up 11%, and then selective retailing, that's sort of your uh, duty-free shoppers and galleria and stuff like that. Depending on where you are in the world, you might have seen them. 26% uh, up, so overall 15% growth. That's pretty impressive stuff. Now my cat actually wants to leave the room and is starting to complain about the length of this video, but um, one of us will persevere, probably not me, right? Look at how spread they are. Europe and Asia are growing, um, US up over the period despite slowdown. Japan, they are up 31%. Asia, excluding Japan, 23% up. Europe, up 22%. And US is, is only 3%. Uh, economy slowing down at the premium level, sort of mid-premium level, right? So that's LVMH. I, I don't think people are going to stop buying handbags and lipsticks and stop drinking champagne and whiskeys and, 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 and cognacs and stuff. I just, just don't think so. And we saw it through COVID. We've seen it through everything that's gone on in the last hundred years or something. And it, it's never really changed. So I think this is a business that will still be around. And yeah, no matter what. So I, that's why it makes makes our list. Now, what about the next one? And I'm going to try and not give it away too obviously what it is, but I, I know you, you could have just glanced at it, but you were cheating. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. Guess. Cash flow. Yeah. Growth health. Yeah. Profit health. That's what we're here for, right? What do you care about as an investor? Do you care how much it grows or do you care how much money they make despite less growth? Cha-ching. Money. Money is all that matters. Profit at the end of the day is what matters. So, so, so. Let's look at some of their, 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 their numbers here. Gross profit margin above my 60% value, bringing in eight and a half billion in profits. And it's coming down a little bit there, right? We'll talk about that. Return on invested capital. I haven't got a number there. Ooh, why not? Very sad. Very sad. Long-term earnings growth rate, 9%. A little on the low side, but it's much cheaper than all the other stocks we've looked at, right? Much cheaper. And that's just a reflection of the data. It's always, the, for these kind of companies, the fundamentals is ultimately what drives the stock price. So that's really what's important here. Revenue growth has been accelerating. It has raised dividends for 15 years in a row. So it pays a dividend. I don't like it, but can't help it. I take it anyway. And doesn't move a lot, the stock price. Short-term obligations exceed liquid assets. Okay, but they've got pretty good free cash flow, right? They haven't got free cash flow on there, but maybe that will come, come up in a bit. And they'll be profitable, so they're making money. Now, how consistent is management with its earnings? With a teeny tiny 13 million blip out of 8 billion revenue in a quarter, they've been beating everything for the last 10 quarters. So management gets a gold star, right? Like a child. Look at that. And you still don't know what this is, do you? Shipment volume is up 3%. Revenues are up 10%. What is that saying to you? It's saying to you prices are going up and they're selling more. Net revenue per unit is up 7%. Income up almost 7%. Earnings per share is 17% higher than in the previous period. Lula, do you want to come back up? She's now sitting next to me complaining wildly. Gross margins, the, one of the... If you want to look at a moat, like does the company have a moat? Look at the gross margin. You've got a gross margin of more than 60% and it's consistent over time. you got yourself a moat. And I'll tell you in a second what the moat is here. And you're starting to give it away. It talks about combustibles, things that can go up in flames. So they have raised their margin by changing the product mix from 63 to 64%. So let's talk about that. On track for third year of total volume growth, increasing top and bottom line, and expect strong organic growth to support margin expansion. 
What does it mean? Well, this is what it means. We're talking, of course, about Philip Morris, another company that morally I object to. I don't think people should be killing themselves with addictive things like nicotine, but people choose to and choose so to do so at rising rates. So you can either take the money or you can not take the money. It's completely up to you. I totally get if you say you don't want it, but I'm just saying to you it's a very, very profitable business. So this is why the money is, is where the money is coming from. It's smoke free stuff. So the volume of smoke free stuff, so not cigarettes, is going from 14 to 16 percent, up 2.4 percent. But look at the revenues. It's gone from 30 to 35 percent. That's double the difference. So this is 2.4 points up, and this is 4.1 points up. So it's selling, telling you that they're charging more for the smoke-free cigarette equivalent to the old, old cigarettes. Not smoking is more profitable for, for Philip Morris than smoking, right? So that's where the money's coming from. So even if less people smoke, they still make more money. And this is just one of the examples. And this is, a, I think this is an incredibly unethical product, but, you know, they're making it. Zin. Zin is basically a little tin that looks like sweets and they are nicotine pouches. You can sort of like nibble on it or chew it or something. I don't know. And it delivers nicotine to you. And they're selling 292 million cans in the previous 12 months. And it doesn't contain any tobacco. So it isn't fall, falling under the same tobacco regulation. And Stuff like this that's making them a lot of money. I think they are fairly evil and knievel, just like the uh, the diabetes lot. Although, in fairness, the well, let's not get into drug companies. Uh, but yes, but it's incredible, isn't it? It's just exploding. Didn't exist in 2017. Now they're selling 292 million, a third of a billion cans a year. Um, 76% of the category's retail value share. They have a 76% market, market share in this chewable category. So there we are. They're not going to go away, the smokers, or those who want to be addicted to something. Now, you might be wondering, Felix, but what about Paladin? What about SoFi? What about all those growth stocks that we talk about a lot? Okay, let me, let me take you through this. Growth stocks should, in my humble opinion, this is not financial advice, be a small percentage of your portfolio to start with. The expected growth will make them a larger part over time. Or if they go out of business, not a lot is lost. So I've put out for you here one sort of ex example. Say your portfolio is $100,000. Could be more, it could be less. And say you take 3% of that and put it into Palantir. Not financial advice, not saying you should do it, but just as an example. So it's $3,000 you got in Palantir. If Palantir grows 10x over the next 10 years, that becomes $30,000. So you got yourself the multi-bagger, the 10x, so you can boast about it on Twitter, or X, as it's now called. The rest of your portfolio will grow, it's just assume, by 3.3x, which is 12% a year, compounded over 10 years. 12% a year over 10 years isn't 1.2x, it's 3.3x. Marvel of compounding. So your portfolio becomes 320,000 plus the 30,000 from Palantir. And therefore, Palantir after 10 years would now be 9% of your portfolio. And that's significant. That's a very, very large position in a portfolio. That's the way I look at growth stocks. Put a little bit of money at it. If it grows a lot, brilliant. If it doesn't, then in 10 years, you've lost only, the, the, the worst case is Palantir goes out of business and out of your 320,000, you've lost $3,000. So you're down 1%. That's your risk. That's how, how I would allocate for growth stocks. And I appreciate some people are allocating 50%, 100% to individual stocks. And I keep ranting and raving against it because I don't think it makes sense. But let me know why you don't think it makes sense. Now, what's my secret? Let me tell you my secret. An embarrassing secret I never thought I'd share. No, it's not quite that bad. Okay. I don't own any of these five stocks directly. So why the video? I own them through a fund called Sunsmith Equity. Available 
only in UK and the European Evil Union. So did I say evil? That just slipped out. Didn't mean it. Well, maybe I did. Why do I do that? Because I used to buy about 20, 30 stocks individually. And then I realized this takes me a fair bit of time. And I like to buy stocks every week, ideally. So one click of a button is better than 30 clicks. So it's ease uh, or easy. Secondly, I think my personal real value add is trading because I am up here are all the trades for the year so far and I am up 73% on return on capital employed. So on the money that we actually deployed 73% this year, 126% last year. So I would rather spend the minutes where I'm clicking buttons 32 times to buy 32 stocks by setting up five trades, which is probably what I can do in that time period and I can make some money. So I've essentially outsourced my portfolio largely. Not entirely, but largely. And they've so far done a pretty good job. What's the downside? Well, they charge me 1% for it a year. 1% fee. Um, but if I can make 70 something percent in a year, I, I don't really care, right? So I quite like the idea. I, I like the fund manager. I think they do a good job. Uh, I don't always understand every decision that they make, but I read their annual reports and so on. And there are very, very few fund managers that I like. This is pretty much the only one that also happens to be the largest one in, in the UK. Um, so again, not a recommendation. I don't endorse them. I don't get anything from it. I just want to be transparent with you so you can understand what's going on here. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. The US has $32 trillion of debt, $32 trillion. That's the whole GDP of China, Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom added together. Crazy, hey? I mean, just bonkers. That's 